Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Legislators gave schools a big funding boost. We find out what that means for administrators, teachers, parents, and students. Plus, more on the efforts to tighten our elections, assist our veterans, and protect sensitive government data. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The largest budget increase for Minnesota schools in the past 15 years easily won the stamp of approval from state lawmakers this summer as students prepare to head back into the classrooms. Joining me to talk about what administrators, teachers, parents, and students can expect this fall is former Lakeville School Board member and current Senate Education Committee member, Zach Duckworth. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Some students have not put their feet under a desk mm -hmm. in quite some time. What was the committee's greatest concern for students as you shaped this budget bill for the coming two years? Sure. I think uh, our biggest concern was how do we afford our schools, districts, teachers, kids and families really a chance to come back to the classroom and give everybody a chance to assess where they really are. So by providing the funding necessary for them to be able to evaluate our kids, see where they are, and provide them the resources that they might need in order to get them back to where we need them to be in order to be successful uh, was very instrumental in, to, in, in uh, our thought process as we, we were putting this bill together. Uh, to include our special education students and families as well. Uh, in conversations with those families regarding their students, they uh, experience some of the most um, disruption and when you have a, a student of special needs and their programming and everything they're doing and their routine and the consistency of it being so important, it was necessary for us to make sure that in this bill, we were providing funding for their resources as well. So that brings up an interesting point because every student, every school district um, across the state is going to have different challenges. And this is a huge increase. It's $1.1 billion over the next four years. 80% of that, that funding will go directly to school districts. And historically, a lot of those funds are earmarked, but Education Chair Senator Roger Chamberlain wanted the districts to decide how to spend the money, not the legislature. So what should parents expect from their school administrators? Mm, right, and I think uh, Senator Chamberlain was, uh, of all the times to kind of have that mentality or mindset, I think this was a good one to have it. Uh, every district has been impacted over the last two school years very uniquely. The challenges they face and the resource issues they might be having are all unique. So allowing them the freedom and the flexibility and the local control they need at the district level to combat those I think was very wise. And so I would expect as a parent to expect your school districts, your school boards, to evaluate the kids, the resources, the teachers, the school buildings, all the things that they might need to help get our kids to where we'd like them to, to be in order to help them continue to be uh, successful moving forward. Um, so that was kind of the, the reasoning behind it. If I was a parent as well, I'd also be engaging directly with my school board, my principal, teachers, uh, in order to help provide feedback uh, and let them know about your child, their needs, what they're experiencing, and how they, they can help best, them, help best have them succeed um, as we welcome kids back to school, uh, it's going to be a community effort to make sure that we are providing them the support and the resources they need in order to be successful. And that's a, a large part of what this bill was aimed at achieving. Uh, another aspect of this bill is mental health of students, which for some um, suffered even more, you know, than, than beyond what is normal because of the pandemic, because of the lack of social interaction. Um, there, what efforts were enacted to help administrators, teachers, parents, mm -hmm. to help address the mental health of kids? Mm -hmm. So there are some behavioral um, uh, health measures that are in the bill. There's training for teachers and staff. Uh, when our, our kids are in grades four through 12, there's certain training that they have to go through or be introduced to in the classroom. We added suicide and self-harm awareness to that list. And we also had a lot of conversation and education of our members and others about uh, the use of uh, mobile devices or iPads and, and screen time and how that can affect our kids. Uh, I think one thing that we heard very consistently from parents and from kids is that they were very concerned about the social, emotional well-being of their kids and their mental health. And I think by providing our schools with uh, the funding that we have without many strings attached, it allows them to to use those funds in the way they see best fit to meet some of these challenges to include behavioral health issues and not to mention the federal 
uh, money they'll be getting as well to invest in our schools and kids. So that's that's how we've gone about tackling that, and I suspect it will continue to be a priority for all of us as we move forward. Now, you mentioned the social media, the technology thing. Mm -hmm. Your children are small, mine are older, but, but you know, managing that digital, um, the devices mm -hmm. and, and how much attention and how drawn kids are to those devices. There's a program that is getting some funding called Live More, Screen Less. And I just wonder as a parent, what your thoughts are on this and then, and then the kind of instruction that this will maybe enable in the schools. Sure, I think you know, what's incumbent upon us as you know, the parents of kids, as the teachers and the administrators and as school boards, as we're looking at how we're gonna implement these uh, tools of technology is how do we strike a balance, right? They can be phenomenal, very useful tools and enhance the quality of education of our students, but at the same time, we have to know what the potential side effects are from misuse or overuse. You can go down the list, whether it's physical, mental, social, emotional. If we allow our, our kids or our students just to kind of use these devices as they see fit without any parameters or any safety precautions or measures, then some of those uh, negative uh, effects can take place on them. But here's the deal. I have to admit, I have to be honest with you. I have a three-year-old <laughs> and a five-year-old. Sometimes They each have their own iPad. Sometimes it's the easy button, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not judging here. Uh, we just have to educate ourselves about what some of those side effects are, be mindful of them, and we have to strike that balance between those being used as great learning tools and also making sure that we're uh, still allowing our kids to be safe as they use them. Minnesota has consistently ranked poorly when measuring the overall performance of students of color against mm -hmm. white students. And lawmakers have spoken for several years about increasing funding for teachers of color. Studies show that students of color do better when their teachers have similar experiences and backgrounds to you know, relate to. What's being done in this area? Because something is going to be done now to increase the teachers of color and American Indian teachers in the classrooms. Absolutely. Uh, this was a, a very important and critical part of this bill. So in this bill, there is language specifically as it relates to our teachers of color. And it, it makes it a requirement now. It's not just a suggestion. School districts must have a plan in place to attract, develop, and retain teachers of color for all the reasons you just mentioned. We know that uh, all of our children, they span the spectrum. They're very diverse. And when they're in the classroom, the studies you mentioned have shown that some of our diverse students, uh, they do better, they're more successful. Their education is superior when they're seeing uh, other uh, diverse teachers in the classroom as well. Someone that maybe looks like them, uh, teaching them in the classroom. Uh, and that's why that language was in the bill. We think it's gonna be extremely helpful. There's some other programs that are initiated in this bill, a grow your own program to make sure that we're helping to um, foster teachers in our own area. Uh, I would imagine that students can probably relate to teachers that look like them as well as teachers who are from where they grew up. Uh, there are, there's funding in there for uh, programs outside of our school districts like the Santa Foundation, Black Men Teach here in the Twin Cities to try to help uh, find great educators, a diverse pool of educators, and get them in front of all of our kids to help them all be as successful as possible. And finally, before we go, mm -hmm. the killing of George Floyd prompted national conversations um, that include how students learn about American history. This law places a two-year delay on the implementation of any new academic standards, including those for social studies. And I wonder what your thoughts are when it comes to the legislature's role in determining educational curriculum. Sure, uh, it's a very good question, a fair question, especially right now. I think, in my humble opinion, the role of the legislature is to ensure that the education of our kids uh, does not become overly politicized. Uh, and to really make sure that it, it's being funded appropriately and allowing school districts, school boards, local communities, families, and their students determine how to best meet the educational needs of their students. Uh, that's, of course, coming from a former school board member, right? The, the much more candid way to answer your question is, let's let our school districts, our school boards, our parents figure out how they want to teach their kids and go about doing that. But what's really important to what you mentioned is uh, academic standards. Uh, were, were paused across the board, not just social studies. This was a chance for us to say to schools all across Minnesota, we know you've been through heck the last couple of school years. We know the workload has been through the roof. We know you've faced a lot of uncertainty, a lot of changes, and so have our kids and their families. So you just finished running a marathon. Let's allow you to take a knee, catch your breath, get reestablished before we start requiring you to implement new academic standards, change lesson plans, and reimagine what you're doing in the classroom. 
So really, the, the intent behind that portion of the bill was to welcome our kids back to the classroom, let our teachers wrap their arms around them, see where they currently are, and get them the help and the resources they need. And once we've done that, we can discuss new standards moving forward. Senator Zach Duckworth, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's done. All right. In a mood of celebration and surrounded by advocates, Governor Tim Walz signed an executive order that will ban conversion therapy in Minnesota. The EO that I'm going to sign uh, empowers existing law that already is in state agencies from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights to the Minnesota Department of Health to the Commerce Department to ensure that no minor Minnesotan, anyone under 18 or vulnerable Minnesotans is subjected to this Byzantine torturous practice of conversion therapy. This law will make that no longer available in Minnesota. I'm here with a simple message, one of love and compassion. First and foremost, I want to say to all of the young Minnesotans who feel isolated, lonely, and despairing, maybe feeling afraid because of what they hear coming from powerful people, or maybe even wondering if they deserve how people treat them or talk about them or think about them, wondering if they could ever have a happy life as deserved. You are perfect. Executive orders are by their nature temporary. The legislature is not off the hook. So I call on my colleagues and the leadership of the Senate and the House to join me in passing our legislation. To, yes. to codify the provisions of this executive order to stand up for those who have no political power and no legal standing of their own accord to uphold the bedrock Minnesota values and our most fundamental of all public responsibilities, to provide care, security, support, and protection so that every single Minnesotan has the dignity, freedom, and ability to live lives they dream of and aspire to. Growing up in a world that self-harm was an often option because I never fit in, um, I felt different, um, I felt like harming myself was better than letting society harm me, this will save lives. Um, I just want to send a message to our kids that you are so uniquely beautiful in who you are. I'm here because at the age of 16, I put myself through conversion therapy. I got a job working at a fast food restaurant so I could pay the $600 to go fix myself because everywhere around me, not just from my peers, but from authority figures that I looked up to, I was being told that there was something wrong with me, that I was broken, that I didn't deserve to be here. And all I ever wanted was to be accepted. <clears throat> just last month, I turned 25. And at the age of 16, I could never envision my life at this point, because I didn't think I would make it this far after conversion therapy failed me, because it didn't work. Now, even though I'm just starting to the process of healing from this trauma, I'm leaving my most beautiful, authentic self, and I'm so proud of myself for that. And my hope is through this executive order, LGBTQ children across the state know there is someone on their side of their court and that they get to live their authentic selves without repercussions or fear from the very beginning. Over the last 15 years, I've worked as a pediatrician who specializes in the care of LGBTQ kids in our state and I have seen firsthand the harms of conversion therapy. I've seen escalating suicide rates. I've seen increasing self-harm practices. And I have seen lasting psychological harm to both kids and their families. One of the key budget bills enacted every two years finances executive and administrative agencies, funds support services for veterans, and ensures election integrity and transparency. It is a wide-ranging bill that impacts all Minnesotans, and joining me in the studio is the chair of the Senate State Government and Elections Committee, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Thank you for being here. Good to be with you today, Shannon. Even though this is not an election year, the topic of election integrity is a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an issue of great importance to you because you served as Minnesota's Secretary of State. What has been done in this bill this year that will enhance the security of our election system, especially when it comes to the ballot drop boxes? 
Well, in regards to those, which are brand new, matter of fact, nationally brand new, just kind of a wave that came upon us, we've added some security, monitoring, cameras. There's more that needs to be done, though, and I try to get some of it done in this bill, but in the conversation with Secretary of State, um, that's all the farther he was willing to go. And then the, his pledge, though, was to continue to work for next session to do some more. So I'm counting on that and looking forward to do some more. But we're grateful for the measures we do have and some of the security that we have there. There are a few other things, too, that were done that I thought were helpful. Um, but you know, remember, in Minnesota, our current laws are really fairly strong. But the biggest thing is we're strongest in the counting of the ballots. Uh, the question is getting them in the ballot box is where we need to put a little bit more integrity and security around that. And my biggest motivation for that, if people do not have confidence in the system, and I mean all the people, have confidence in the system, then they are less desirous of participating. And you see that in many areas of life. So that's, that's what really motivates me is to help make sure that all the people have that confidence. As I mentioned in my introduction, this bill also funds veterans and military affairs. And the support services um, is, is one of those expansions or, or enhancements this year. There's going to be the development of Montevideo, Bemidji, and Preston Veterans Homes. Is the state well positioned to handle the continued demand for veteran services, especially as the baby boomers age? Well, absolutely. It's definitely a concern. And I would say that because we have these three homes approved in one year, which is really quite amazing, quite amazing. So those three homes are not only approved federally in the money to do that work, which is very, very important, but also we were able to put in my bill the maintenance requirement, which is required by federal rules, by federal law. So we were able to accomplish both to take that federal money. And with three new homes, especially the first one up in Bemidji, that's up in the northwest corner, first time. Another one in, um, in the western side of Minnesota. So those are three very welcome locations. So I think as far as we can know right now, I think that's going to really be helpful in preparing us for that boomer of veterans. Uh, we spoke about this once before, and now it's a reality, a legislative commission on cybersecurity. Um, you've often spoken about the importance of transparency, but mm -hmm. when it comes to cybersecurity, some of you know the tactics, the, the things that the legislature may do to protect right. itself must be secret. We don't want the hackers to know what we're planning to do to keep our information intact. So where's the balance there? What can talk a little bit about that? I think that's why we um, approved and uh, the governor signed into law that cybersecurity commission because it gives a limited number of legislators and then it gives them the power and the authority to go into a private session where then the IT staff can tell them the inside <laughs> information that they need to know uh, to feel that we are doing what is necessary for cybersecurity. So this is the first time you know, to do that, but transparency is that they are meeting, transparency is that it's gotta be uh, for those details in secret, but otherwise, as far as the general public, to at least know that legislators through this commission, by Camerly, House and Senate together, are looking out for their interests in making sure that the data is secure. Uh, twice a year, people like me groan and complain <laughs> about the change in the time. And in this bill, uh, there's a provision to eliminate daylight saving time if the federal government right. will allow it. So what does the federal government need to do? How is Minnesota positioning itself for this? Well, the federal government um, uh, introduced, I think, uh, senators from Florida introduced it in uh, the 2018 session and since then 19 states including Minnesota have passed resolutions or laws that say if the feds do allow it and then we can as a state uh, it will be automatic it triggers after the first flip whenever that flip happens to daylight saving time then we will stay on it no more flipping and it's very unhealthy car accidents strokes heart attacks babies, mothers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, senior citizens, and all kinds of people. Statistics show it is very unhealthy to have this flipping. But overwhelmingly, Minnesotans, after I introduced this about two years ago, it was quite a heated debate, I want to tell you. My, I opened up one email. Matter of fact, most of them, the large number, were for let's keep daylight saving time. That evening light is more precious 
to Minnesotans. They kind of hate losing, but yes. they would rather have it in the evening, overwhelmingly um, support of the daylight saving all year round. The final bill requests that the legislative auditor conduct an audit of the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it does read as a request, though, not a mandate. And Jim Nobles, our legislative auditor, did tell Minnesota Public Radio that the scope of that request is much too large and would take away from other projects that their, their um, auditing agency is doing. So is there a particular aspect of the state's response that you would like to see those auditors investigate? Well, there are, only in the sense that I think we can have a great deal of trust in Mr. Nobles. He has a lot of trust. But I also told the Associated Press when they first interviewed me, this is going to be dependent upon Mr. Nobles' judgment of all of his resources. And the bill hadn't been passed and signed into law yet. So he's going to have to do that. So we're in line with that. But Mr. Nobles, as an auditor, would prefer um, to wait until there are problems that arise or questions that arise and then zero in. So I said, if something is running along and do an audit there, that doesn't quite have the same benefit to the taxpayers. And so he usually says, let's let this go for a little while, see where maybe some of the weak spots are. He might do some random audits. I think we, I'm on the Legislative Audit Commission, and um, I also chair the topic selection. So I think there's going to be some areas we're going to go to. But remember, we've gotten two full uh, tranches, as they call them, of federal money, CARES Act 1 and 2, and now we have the ARPA, and that is a third um, bunch of money. So it isn't even all spent yet, committed to. There's still lots of questions to be held. So waiting a little while is just fine. I know Mr. Nobles would do a good job when he does it. Um, it's recently come to light that Representative John Thompson carries a Wisconsin driver's license, calling into question whether he lives in his legislative district. Is a law change necessary, um, or does the Secretary of State need to do a different set of practices to ensure that um, a candidate lives in the place that they seek to represent? It definitely something needs to happen. Uh, the concern I have when you talked about transparency before, this is where transparency is really, really important. I'm not convinced, even now that I've seen what's happened here and taking a look at this law, that we should even allow elected representatives to hide their address where they live. To me, that's a public right to know. They should know that their person they're voting for lives in the district that they're wanting to represent. That's a real basic 101 kind of thing to me. So I don't know if maybe um, this time is maybe um, no longer uh, good to do that. Could the Secretary of State do more? But in the letter that I received from that, how far should they go investigate their home? So they do a background check. I mean, it, it's almost unlimited is what you might do. But the real responsibility about who lives in the district belongs to the candidate. That candidate is responsible, and the candidate needs to be the one who proves that they're eligible because they live in that district. So it may be a law that as time has come to end it. At the same time, in the uh, concerns that I've heard from others about, uh, security um, threats myself, you know. So, but I live on a out in the country on a long <laughs> road. If you can get through the snow in the winter, have at it. But we passed uh, a law, signed into law, uh, that they can use three thousand dollars of their campaign account, uh, categorized under non-campaign expenditures for security, ID protection, uh, credit card monitoring, and security like these cameras and different things that you have in your home that they can do that. I think that is more valuable to the legislators, but I'm really, I'm gonna hold hearings. I've got a bill mm -hmm. being drafted right now. I'm gonna hold hearings on it, see what the people have to say and go from there. Senator Mary Kifmar, it's so good to see you, thank you. <laughs> good to see you too, Shannon, thank you. Symmetry, functionality, and beauty were essential components of architect Cass Gilbert's aesthetic. Historian Brian Pease explains how these concepts come together in the grand second floor of the Capitol. The second floor of the state Capitol is really the focal point of all of the activity that happens here. What was Cass Gilbert's idea behind this particular design? 
The uh, second floor is really called the grand floor of the Capitol because it's where everyone can come up here, get access to the chambers, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And it's a place where all that activity is taking place each day of session. So you have people lobbying for interest groups here. You have the public that are here to talk to their legislators and so forth or go to the Supreme Court for their hearings. So really the, the envision that Cass Gilbert had for this uh, space and the second floor was to be a grand space where you really get a sense of the, the architecture, these beautiful colonnades of Italian marble column and Minnesota stone. And you also get a place where people feel friendly or welcoming into those spaces as at the same time they're visiting or coming here for business. In the other capitals I've visited, I've noticed that the House Chamber is often across from the Senate Chamber, but not here in our capital. What is the reason for that? Well, I think what Cass Gilbert was looking at doing is creating a, a symmetrical building. And so we have, in 1905, there were 63 senators, not the 67 we have today, but we had 119 House members. So that's almost twice the size. So I think for him, how you construct a building with one end of the building with a smaller chamber and the other opposite end with a huge chamber just doesn't fit architecturally. So he put the Senate chamber on the west side of the building, the Supreme Court, a smaller chamber of course, on the opposite end and then the house because of its size fit perfectly in the north corridor or the north side of the buildings. It may just be a matter of folklore but I've read that the placement of the house chamber looking at the city of St. Paul is important in terms of representing the people, that the speaker is looking at the people. Is that true? Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people look at the, the way the uh, spaces have been designed or laid out, uh, that Gilbert was looking at the house being kind of the approachable. It's more of the people's house. The members serve a two-year term, so there's more rotation or more changeover as uh, members leave or get uh, re-elected or not re-elected. And there are more of them. And there's more of them as well. And so the idea is, it kind of symbolically, it faces the public, faces downtown St. Paul. In 1905, when the Capitol opened, the cons all of the state's constitutional offices were housed in this building, and that's not true today. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The uh, whole idea of the building here was, this is the seat of state government. So you have your executive branch officers, you have the governor, lieutenant governor, the state treasurer, the state auditor, the uh, secretary of state. Uh, the Attorney General all housed within this one building in 1905. And that gives you a sense of how this building has changed over its 112 year history because you have uh, a lot of those constitutional officers moving out to different chambers. They're going into uh, the state office building back in the 60s and the 70s. You had the administration building where the treasurer moved into. Now the treasurer, we as a constitutional amendment, abolished the treasurer's office so there no longer is a treasurer. And that also fits in with the, the history of the Supreme Court too. They uh, were, until the 1990s, uh, everything they had here, the offices, the law library, the chamber was their headquarters, kind of their center gathering place for all the work and all the business they do. And then when the uh, Judicial Center was open, they moved there. And so they have new uh, Supreme Court and appellate court offices and also uh, chambers there. But they still use this space in the state capitol as an important part of their connection to this building. again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.